True crime as a form of entertainment has been around for quite a while, long before investigation, discovery, and Netflix documentaries anyway. Just look at the way newspapers talked about Jack the Ripper over a hundred years ago. They sensationalized the murders and journalists even used the opportunity to draw racist conclusions. They said things like the people of Whitechapel were suspicious and unhealthy and a quote, strange amalgamation of Jews, French, Germans, and other antagonistic elements. Virtually every paper back then blamed the women for putting themselves in a position of a murder victim, saying they'd lived an unfortunate life. Yes, the tabloids existed over a hundred years ago. And yes, they covered topics as unsettling as this, even sensationalizing and dramatizing the events to sell papers. Sound familiar? Unfortunately, we haven't got much better today. True crime may look different now, but there are still a lot of similarities between these tabloids and the way true crime is presented. This isn't to say that all true crime shows are presented in an exploitative nature, but human tragedy is all too often seen as entertainment. Recently, more and more fans of the true crime genre have started to take note of this and spoke out, especially after the horrific way some of these cases have been treated in the past couple years. Less than two years ago, the case of 22 year old Gabby Petito went viral. A young woman went missing, her fiance nowhere to be found. It was a massive case. And it seemed like almost everyone online considered themselves a detective, leading to a constant stream of theories as to what happened to Gabby. And this isn't all a terrible thing. Having awareness and eyes on a case is so important and can help keep it from going cold. However, when people have used her name to garner followers on TikTok, then yeah, that's a different story. Some TikTokers even stood to make over $1,000 for their relentless coverage of the case. Others claiming to be psychics and mediums said they knew where Gabby's body was and they were trying to channel her spirit. And if this feels icky and gross to you when you didn't even know Gabby personally, then imagine how upsetting it must be for Gabby's loved ones. The line between awareness about these cases and exploiting them may be blurry at times, but it shouldn't be. There's one simple question that should be asked. Are you okay with this if it was your loved one? If your friend or family member went missing and you saw TikTokers making thousands of videos speculating what happened to them and dissecting their lives, would you appreciate it or find it in bad taste? Even more recently, TikTokers have posted multiple conspiracy theories about the four University of Idaho students who were stabbed to death this past November. A tarot card reader on the platform accused one of the college professors of murdering the students without having any evidence to do so, leading to a lawsuit that accused her of using the community's pain for her own self-promotion. All these videos implying other roommates were involved definitely don't help bring actual justice to these cases. And even when someone was arrested for the crime, the speculation and TikToks have continued. While social media can be a great tool for talking about cases, it can absolutely put things in a morally gray area too, especially when you report on a topic as sensitive and graphic as murder. But there's more to it than profiting off the tragedy too. There's also the way true crime is reported and how it cements racial bias in the justice system. There's a lack of awareness and knowledge about victims, especially when serial killers are involved. Plus there's a sort of desensitization or on the opposite end, a paranoia that avid true crime fans experience when discussing death. It gets even worse than exploitation. True crime programs have allegedly withheld evidence for the sake of releasing it further during the finales or lying to victims' families to get DNA for their programs. Unfortunately, it does get that bad. The troubles with true crime are numerous, and while we can't touch upon all of them today, I want to highlight some of the overarching issues that have led us to the place of questioning the genre as a whole. Hello everyone, and welcome to Dark Dives. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're going to be talking about the true crime industry. You know who they are. The documentaries about serial killers and cold cases on Netflix, television programs and channels like Investigation Discovery devoted to true crime, and even YouTubers and podcast hosts who pick apart details of infamous murder cases. But before we can talk about the harm being done here, we have to recognize the difference between an exploitative program and an informative one. As a disclaimer, this is obviously my opinion. And here's what I find troublesome and you might think it's entertaining and harmless. The lines are pretty blurry here. And truthfully, these mindsets can change from episode to episode or even creator to creator. So let's take a look at what can really make a true crime program unethical. Now, the biggest, most obvious point is to examine how the victims are portrayed as victims. Families and friends of murder victims have said time and time again that they wish more thought was given to their loved ones. 
Instead, they're used as a vehicle to tell the story of a depraved killer. And it might be interesting to hear a true crime narrative about a murderer to try and comprehend why someone would do something so awful. But by putting the entire focus on a perpetrator, we're only giving them the attention that they want as opposed to recognizing the real tragedy and loss here, which are the lives of the the victims, the people who were killed. Whether it's shows like Extremely Wicked, Shockingly Evil and Vile about Ted Bundy or the Dahmer series, killers themselves receive documentary after documentary focused on their lives, whereas so many victim stories remain untold or glossed over. Online, this is arguably worse. One TikToker featured on Distractify claimed, my mom's close friend was murdered and I can't find a single video without them laughing and a HelloFresh sponsorship. Commenters replied to her saying that there are some creators out there that create this type of true crime content well, like Danielle Hallen. Though Hallen may work with sponsors to keep her channel going, and I also understand the struggle, she works closely with victims' families. She and others will often donate to related charities and organizations too, perhaps making the profit they receive a bit more ethical. So yes, they are paying themselves some sort of salary, but they aren't forgetting about the grieving families that they're advocating for change. Kendall Ray too offers friends and families of murder victims a form in her description box so they can reach out and ask her to talk about their loved one, to tell their person's story and to give it media coverage that it may not have had otherwise. There are other content creators though, such as Bailey Sarian, who have been accused of doing the exact opposite. Her murder mystery and makeup series has grown more controversial as time's gone on and more people have become more aware of these exploitations within the true crime industry. Bailey herself has even said at the start of one of her episodes, quote, let me talk about somebody getting murdered while I do my makeup. I don't even know how to approach this without sounding insensitive at all. And for many, it is insensitive. The tone of voice would arguably lead you to believe that Bailey is gossiping, not recounting a brutal murder. This isn't necessarily the case throughout the entire episode, but it's undoubtedly led to her channel and multiple others being looked at and scrutinized. For Bailey, it's makeup. For Stephanie Sue, she combines murder cases with mukbangs. And sure, perhaps when you combine these brutal cases with someone more easygoing and calming, the content perhaps is more palatable, more lighthearted. But is that even really a good thing? Should we be downplaying these horrific crimes? I mean, when I see a title called Fried Chicken Solved the Murder of Seven People or They Use Dead Corpses as Medicine with a thumbnail of someone about to binge food, it does kind of rub me the wrong way. And of course, opinion here, maybe that's just me. Maybe you see no problem with this, but I can't take it seriously. It's just hard for me to believe that someone made the thumbnail, title, or content with the victim's justice and story in mind and said, ah yeah, that's the one, chief. The fact is that when victims' families aren't contacted, these shows can re-traumatize them. We saw this recently with the Dahmer Netflix series. Rita Isbell gave a powerful victim statement at Dahmer's sentencing in 1992, a statement that was reenacted during the Dahmer series. Now, 30 years later, she relived that moment, explaining that if she didn't know any better, she would have thought the actress was her. Seeing her performance brought back all the emotions. As Rita told Insider, she was never contacted by Netflix. They didn't ask her anything. They didn't warn anyone. Eric Perry, cousin to Errol Lindsay, one of Dahmer's victims also stated, I know true crime media is huge right now, but if you're actually curious about the victims, my family, the Isbells are pissed about this show. It's re-traumatizing over and over again. And for what? How many movies, shows, documentaries do we need? My family found out when everyone else did. So when they say they're doing this with respect to the victims or honoring the dignity of the family, no one contacts them. He continued, my cousins wake up every few months at this point with a bunch of calls and messages and they know there's another Dahmer show. It's cruel. This doesn't even begin to touch on the disturbing way some of these platforms portray serial killers, but more on that in my romanticizing serial killers episode from a few months ago. All in all, it's the lack of thought for the victims and their families that remains one of my biggest issues with the genre as a whole. It's hard to know exactly how this should be handled, but asking these family members and loved ones is a necessary step that true crime isn't taking nearly as much as it should. Some of these programs also go into trauma porn or trauma voyeurism territory too, which can lead to victims being remembered solely for their death or for a horrific event that took place in their past. Should the crime be accurate when it's discussed? Yes, absolutely. But dramatizing death and talking about the way someone died or was tortured in gory, gruesome detail can be re-traumatizing for family members and victims of the event. This is often most seen in BIPOC communities, like when graphic footage of black men being shot by police goes viral, such as the way we saw with the case of Jacob Blake. 
Attorney Destiny Singh argues that this doesn't really spread awareness either. Quote, to say that we're raising awareness is to blatantly ignore this country's past, she says. America is already aware, it just doesn't care. Trauma porn can be so incredibly dehumanizing. While the clips that circulate like these may not necessarily be considered part of the true crime genre as it's not like they're on television programs, it's still upsetting to see them still treated that way as more content to just consume. Now, that's not to say that I place all the blame for this industry's exploitation solely on large platforms like Netflix or individual creators like Bailey or Stephanie, or even the people that spread these videos. It's just the way that true crime and trauma porn has been done for a while now. However, the deeper you dig, the more you see that it goes beyond questionable content and insensitivity, but true crime can tread into more dangerous waters too. There are quite a few risks with the true crime industry apart from what it may do to victims and their families. And the first one I wanna talk about is the biases. Producers, directors, whatever the case may be, the people telling these stories will naturally have a bias or inclination to talk about a murder one way or another. This isn't always a major problem, but it can be, especially if someone's desire to tell a good story gets in the way of telling the truth. On the podcast Serial, for example, Sarah Koenig says, I don't think the state's story is the correct story when discussing how Adnan Syed, the man in prison for murder, was wrongfully accused. According to the New Statesman, this is a provocative, rebellious, exciting statement leading to the whole, we'll never know for sure what happened kind of ending. This way, true crime fans can make up their own mind, draw their own conclusions, and sort of piece together the puzzle of the crime for themselves. While it's exciting to have our expectations turned on our head and see the dominant narrative of a story be twisted around, it's not always factual. Plus, no, the state doesn't always get things right, so it's not as if saying as much is inherently problematic. The story even had people looking twice at the case, eventually leading to Adnan's release. As impactful and important as Sarah's work has been, it's also noteworthy that she says her relationship with Adnan is quote, weird and hard to define, as well as a personal relationship, not truly professional. She also neglected to mention key evidence when presenting the podcast, such as diary extracts that portray him as abusive to his girlfriend, the case's victim, Han Min Lee. In my opinion, two things are true here. One, the state didn't have enough evidence to put Adnan away and his imprisonment is unjustified until he can be proven guilty. Sarah did a fantastic job bringing light to this. Second, Sarah is biased and neglected to offer crucial evidence. So her words shouldn't be seen as gospel simply because it pokes holes in a sloppy narrative told by the state. Other shows that aren't artistically rendered, like Making a Murderer, risk losing any kind of subjectivity when the people making the program become close with accused killers. Relationships might be strained, editing can sensationalize stories or change timelines, but mistakes happen, right? At least the police have all the evidence that a true crime show may fail to disclose, right? No, not only will true crime shows fail to disclose evidence to viewers, whether that's intentional or accidental, but they'll fail to disclose it to authorities too. According to New Statesman, the makers of The Jinx used a handwriting sample from an unidentified murderer in their story and compared it to that of a suspected serial killer and interview subject, Robert Durst. Then they buried this lead for the sake of suspense and used it in the show's reveal, presenting it to Durst and recording his audio in which he states, quote, the hell did I kill them all, of course. But they didn't present this audio to the police, not for months. Durst was arrested when the finale aired and I cannot begin to explain how fucked up this actually is. The Jinx had evidence that could potentially help put this guy away, and for no other reason aside from suspense, they withheld it. Not only does this do tremendous dishonor to the victims and their families that are desperate for answers, but it proves, at least to me anyway, that the people that held on to this care about their program and profit more than anything else. It's great that the Jinx helped put Durst away eventually, absolutely. But even if there was a genuine delay in getting Durst's audio confession, it still seems like producers could have told law enforcement before telling the public instead. After all, if you really know this guy's a killer, wouldn't you wanna stop him before he could hurt anybody else? Now, the producers claimed that they didn't know they had this audio at first because Durst was speaking into a hot mic, a mic he didn't know was on when he used the restroom. Personally, I don't buy this for a second because the producers would have had this audio for some time when they assembled the documentary and planned on releasing it. It's not as if they found this the night before, right? Therefore, I think their excuses are pathetic and should be considered as withholding evidence. Now, there are other gruesome, thoughtless acts these programs partake in for the sake of shock value too. 
Like for example, when Oxygen used a DNA sample on their miniseries, The Disappearance of Natalie Holloway. Natalie's mom, Beth, said that she had only given the sample to an investigator to test bones that were supposedly found recently, not knowing that they would be used for a TV show. Grosser still, Beth alleges that the bones weren't discovered at all, but pig's bones that the producers used just to get a sample from her. Quite a few programs have faced defamation suits over the years for trying to steer the public one way or another into believing something they can't truly prove. Personally, I think that's especially slimy when it's done in regards to victims, as they're not here to defend themselves, and in these cases, it's because of a tragic end. So then we've discussed one extreme, when programs go so far one way that they seem to take justice into their own hands. But what about the other? When programs reinforce other biases? In 2021, when the discussion of true crime as a genre became a hot topic in the midst of Gabby Petito's disappearance, the New York Times wrote an article posing the question if true crime hurts more than it helps. While true crime can be useful, and I'll touch more on this in a moment, it can also entrench the flaws of the American criminal justice system. What the article means by this is that the genre as a whole most often casts white women as victims, even though men of color are disproportionately the victims of violent crimes. According to Lindsay Webb, a criminal defense lawyer and law professor, this isn't all far off the mark from danger narratives. And in case you're unaware, danger narratives have been used to promote white supremacy for decades. While you might think of the 1800s and famous cases in which white people would make false accusations, often sexual assault charges against black men, danger narratives absolutely exist today. Lindsay Webb writes in the Journal of Gender, Race and Justice, A white man who massacred nine African-American people in a Charleston prayer group in 2015 said he did so because African-American people were raping our women and are taking over our country. That's not to say that this is the same as what true crime does today. I don't believe that the genre, at least not generally speaking, is going so far as to create obvious danger narratives, but there's no denying that true crime very much represents white women and perpetuates stereotypes. There's a huge disparity in the races that are represented as victims to the point where we've coined terms such as missing white woman syndrome. And that term simply means that major news outlets are far more likely to talk about missing white women than they are women of color. The term was first used two decades ago, but we still see it today, like in the Gabby Petito case. To be crystal clear here, Gabby Petito absolutely deserves justice regardless of the color of her skin. However, missing indigenous women, black women, and other women of color also deserve justice regardless of the colors of their skin. And many of them haven't gone viral with hundreds of millions of views or hashtags dedicated to them. The way Gabby's name was exploited is disgusting, but ultimately the attention on her led people to demand answers. And it's a shame that by contrast, so few people demand answers for women or men of other races. It's also extremely upsetting that when black people are victims in true crime genres, like in the Dahmer series, some people end up glorifying, romanticizing, or even identifying with the serial killer, especially if they're white. One of the reasons Dahmer was able to get away with his crimes for so long is because the police didn't take the disappearances of these young gay black men seriously. This treatment unfortunately still holds true today, even if we might not like looking in that ugly mirror. So. Who's watching all these investigation discovery shows and why aren't they demanding change? Well, white women also typically watch these programs in which white women are often portrayed as the victims. For some women, they may even consider it healing. Some fans that have survived domestic abuse claim that it's healing. Others argue that true crime is somewhat of a feminist movement as they're able to see themselves in the program's victims and see justice done for them. This can still ring true, but as Lindsay Webb explains, I think we can have a deep understanding and respect the humanity of the women who are the focus of these narratives and simultaneously critique the narratives as a whole. Opinions about true crime are going to differ from person to person and show to show. However, broadly speaking, representing others is not something true crime has done all that well. There are things the genre gets right though, and that stems from the sense of justice. As the industries become more and more popular, there are more diverse shows too. The podcast In the Dark, for example, investigates the failures of law enforcement and miscarriages of justice. This gives what the New York Times calls reformative potential. While some articles argue that true crime can come across as just cop propaganda, there are shows out there that aim to do the exact opposite. We've been exposed to more acts of police brutality and injustice in recent years. The prison population in America has become a hot topic of conversation and movements to defund the police have gained support. 
The true crime genre, it seems, is starting to reflect that little by little. Even while researching for this episode, an article was released about the Netflix series, The Killing Fields, which discusses at length how the police seem to neglect, ignore, or even mishandle evidence located in Texas in the 1970s. Not only that, but as these stories and crimes take on new life, there are shows out there that focus on the victims too. The Killing Field being one of them, but another documentary I watched quite a long time ago for an episode, The Keepers, was also careful to honor the victim stories. It can be done. The genre of true crime as a whole can move forward and successfully tell victim stories in a respectful manner. While I personally haven't seen that happen around shows involving infamous serial killers like Ted Bundy or Jeffrey Dahmer, I do hope that more docu-series, podcasts, TV programs, and whatever else it may be can make this new direction become the norm. And as we gain the momentum for change, I hope they can become more inclusive to respect tragedies, injustices, and stories in more communities. But what about the damage that's already been done? True crime can be exploitative, insensitive, and biased. What are the consequences of the true crime genre? And before we jump into taking a look at some of those consequences, I'm gonna go ahead and take a moment to place today's sponsor here. Again, there is really no good place to place it, so I'm just placing it towards the end. How many of us have already fallen behind on our New Year's resolutions? Yeah, me too. But there's one resolution that you can keep, saving money. You don't have to stress and tear your hair out every single month at the sight of 100 plus dollar phone bills. With Mint Mobile, you can pay just 15 bucks a month to get high-speed data on the nation's largest 5G network, as well as unlimited talk and text. Plus, with Mint Mobile's flexible plans, you can adjust your data usage as needed. So you only pay what you use and don't pay for what you don't. It's as simple as that. You all know that Casper loves Mint Mobile, especially to run his business bark. But today, I want to tell you how much I love it. I switched to Mint Mobile over two years ago, and I know I'm never going back. With my old provider, I not only overpaid for service, but they tried to continue charging me even after I asked them to cancel, filled out the paperwork, went through you know all the hoops, jumped through the flaming fire, and did everything that I needed, gave them a sample of blood, promised for a firstborn child, and they still wouldn't cancel my service. And then when I refused to pay for a service that I wasn't getting anymore, they sent me to collections and had to get a lawyer involved. It was a headache. It was a nightmare. And all of it stems from a terrible provider that just didn't care. Now, I know exactly what to expect every single month, a consistent low phone bill with incredible service. And that includes the amazing customer service too. But that's not all. Mint Mobile also offers international roaming in Mexico and Canada. So you can stay connected while traveling. And their bring your own phone program is kind of amazing too, because you can keep your current phone and number and simply switch to Mint Mobile. Or if you do what I did, change all of it. And that's a great thing too, because Mint Mobile has a wide range of phones to choose from. They've got everything from the new Apple iPhone 14 Pro to the Google Pixel 7 to the Samsung Galaxy Note 20. Keeping New Year's resolutions is hard and saving money has only gotten more difficult in this turbulent economy. But not all your bills have to be stressful and upsetting. This new year, you can save money and simplify your life with Mint Mobile. I mean, for God's sake, y'all, it's 2023. Don't let overpriced phone bills weigh you down for another year. Instead, switch to Mint Mobile and take more control of your finances. So to get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash Casper. Again, that's mintmobile.com slash Casper. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash Casper. Any community, be it centered around a musician, popular show, or the true crime genre can be toxic in certain areas and some more than others. But the especially concerning thing about the latter is that the stakes are far higher and the debates can be around those who committed a murder, not which song is best on a new album. Don Cecil, a criminology professor at the University of South Florida, explains that true crime forums can be echo chambers that feed our fear or buttress pre-existing beliefs. If someone brings forward a piece of evidence that's missing context and people build upon it bit by bit, then it's creating a false narrative around someone that may or may not have done anything wrong. There are articles out there that present the positive side of armchair detectives, insisting that podcasts and social media really can do wonders in bringing cold cases to light. Plus, hobbyist investigators can launch themselves into one case for months and completely immerse themselves into it, whereas detectives with full caseloads can't necessarily do that. There are benefits, absolutely, but it's a fine line to walk between helpful and harmful. According to News Nation Now, quote, the line between internet sleuthing and unwarranted harassment is razor thin. 
Professional investigators are bound by the law and prosecutors must prove their case in court. Armchair detectives have no such obligation and are often reckless in their rush to judgment. Maybe they'll flood police with tips formulated from incomplete information or get tunnel vision on a single hypothesis. That's not to say police or detectives don't do that, but those who get extremely invested in true crime can absolutely cross those lines. After all, these shows can be addicting and lead to negative psychological effects if you're watching them too much, perhaps making people paranoid or desensitized to tragedy. Avid true crime lovers have said that they've needed to take a step back and realize that the victims they were just discussing were real people or that they were embarrassed at how gleefully they consumed true crime. That's not to say people can't watch this genre, but when there's so much of it and when some of it is presented in such an insensitive manner, then it doesn't seem like it's that far of a stretch to say that the audience, even unintentionally, can begin to treat these topics in a casual way too. All in all, it's just important to recognize that the people behind true crime existed and their families and loved ones deserve to know that in death and post-death, their stories are going to be treated with respect. Thankfully, I really can say that a lot of true crime out there, many of them do take the time to speak with victims, interview family members, and more and more often, we're seeing more people within this community demand that killers get less glorification. Unfortunately, it is still a reality that many of the true crime shows don't respect the victims that they're profiting from. And until that changes, I'd really take a close look at the programs you support within the genre. Would you be all right if they told your loved one's story the same way? But with all of that being said, that is where I'm ending today's episode of Dark Dives. I hope this gave you some food for thought and something to think about. And if it did, please make sure that you're liking, following, subscribing for more content. I obviously don't cover true crime or this kind of stuff often, but I do take a look at dark topics, at corrupt businesses and things of that nature. So thank you so much for tuning into today's episode. I really do appreciate it. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye.